been doing a series on personal convictions, and uh, for those of you who have been around church a long time and had a faith in Jesus Christ for a long time, you're quite familiar with the Bible, and uh, these are probably not new ideas or principles to you, but uh, every once in a while we need to check is our life lining up with what we really believe, or do I really believe what I say I believe, what I think I believe? And the truth is, my life is lining up what I really believe, because <laughs> that's what our behavior does. It follows our thoughts and our belief pattern. And so some of these are foundational truths that we want to make sure are in place, and especially as I believe, we are heading into the last last days of, of time as we know it on this earth, and, and uh, we do want to be solid in our faith. And so that's the reason for this series. So far we've covered the topics of what are my personal convictions about the Bible, what are my personal convictions about God, God the Father, and what are my convictions about the Holy Spirit. And so today we're going to look at what are my convictions about Jesus Christ. Our key passage today is uh, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed or engaged to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child, she was pregnant, of the Holy Spirit. The Father was the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. And you can just imagine if you would have been Joseph and your fiancé turns up pregnant and you know you haven't caused that, uh, something might seem suspect and uh, you might be tempted to break off that arrangement, that relationship. And so that's what happened. And the Bible's not shy about telling us the truth. But while he thought about these things, he didn't jump to conclusions, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Now, let me just back up and say when we talked about what are your convictions about the Bible, we talked about how God inspired all the writers of the Bible to write what they wrote. And so that's what this is saying, spoken by the Lord. His inspiration led the prophet to write, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And of course, that's in Isaiah 7.14, 700 years before this event actually happened. So then Joseph, being aroused from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. And so we're looking at what are your convictions about Jesus, this Jesus, this Jesus who was born uh, to Mary and fathered by the Holy Spirit which prophecy was given 700 years before by the prophet Isaiah. Just a side note here. Um, notice in verse, uh, language is interesting. Notice in verse 20, it says, Joseph had a dream uh, and an angel came and spoke to him and said, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife. And then later it says, Joseph in verse 24 being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. 
Well, that didn't sound like a command when it says, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. It doesn't sound like a command. And so how could that be a command? You know, the difference of how we receive something spoken to us has to do with the relationship we have of the person speaking to us. And because Joseph was a committed follower of God, he took what came from God very seriously. He took it as instruction, as a command. But if someone was to ask you, who is Jesus? How would you answer that question to them? What comes to mind, even as I mentioned that this morning? Do some thoughts come to your mind? What you would say? Our understanding of who Jesus is depends upon what kind of relationship we have with him and how much we know about him. The spectrum of people's opinions about Jesus is very broad. Some people know very little about Jesus and yet have a strong negative attitude about him. And many, many others claim him as their Savior and their Lord, but can't really give an explanation for why they believe in him, or wouldn't have much to say to answer that previous question. We as his followers have a responsibility to accurately understand who he is, partly so that we can help others know the truth about him too. And that's the question we're going to answer today, at least in part so that it can strengthen your convictions regarding what you believe about Jesus and how you will respond to him in your daily lives, including when you get opportunities to share about him to others. So who is Jesus? Well, let me first say something about the title you often see as you read the Bible. It often includes the word Christ, Jesus Christ. Christ. The word Christ is really a title, and I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but I do want to mention it since it appears so often in Scripture. The term Christ means the Messiah or the Rescuer, the Savior, or the Anointed One. Throughout history, two groups of people were anointed, priests and kings. And so the title Christ is fitting for Jesus because when he came to earth the first time, 2,000 years ago, he fulfilled the role of a priest, a high priest, in fact, as the book of Hebrews tells us. And then when he returns to this earth, and we are looking forward to that now, he will fulfill the role of a king, and he will literally rule the earth first for a thousand year period of time. So therefore, to be called Jesus the Christ, or simply Jesus Christ, is totally fitting for who he is and the roles that he carries out. Following that, followers of Jesus are known as Christians, Christ eons, which literally means a little Christ. I-A-N means a little, or better, a little anointed one. And uh, that anointing <clears throat> comes from God's Holy Spirit. 1 John 2.20 tells us about this. And it says, But you, referring to believers, have an anointing from the Holy One. The Holy One being the Holy Spirit. And uh, verses 21 to 27 of 1 John 2 elaborates on that. You can read more about that on your own. And so Jesus is the Christ, the Anointed One and the Messiah. Well, what else do we know about Jesus? I'm going to quickly cover eight other points <clears throat> about Jesus this morning. So number one, Jesus lived, he was alive before he was even conceived in his mother's womb. Now, there's never been another person like that in the entire world. And so Christ didn't come into existence when he was born as a baby. 
in the passage that we just read. He pre-existed that, and in fact has existed since eternity past. Then at the appointed time, he came to earth in human form while still retaining his deity, his godness. <laughs> And that's a hard concept for the natural mind to comprehend, but that's the truth taught in the Bible. And as we've seen in previous weeks, the Bible is the most trustworthy and reliable book ever written, not to mention the most read and bestseller for 500 years. Back in the book of Genesis, which was written about 1,500 years before Jesus came to earth, 1500 years BC, we see a record recorded in Genesis 1.26 at creation where God said this. He said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And the plurality of the personal pronouns there, us, our, our, reveals that all three members of the Trinity were together at the time of creation, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so not only is God from eternity, past and future, Jesus also is from eternity past until eternity future. Hard for the natural mind to comprehend, but that's who he is. Then about 1,500 years later, or 2,000 years ago to us, when Jesus literally walked on this same earth that we're on, in the country of Israel, we see another record given in the New Testament in the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 1. Jesus' pre-existence is also confirmed by John. And he refers to Jesus as the Word. It says, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word is capitalized, so that's referring to Jesus, and the Word was with God, the Father, and the Word was God. Of course, God is made up of three persons, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, if one reads the entire book of John, you'll get a fuller understanding of what that term Word means. But the point is, there, the Apostle John makes the point that Jesus existed from the beginning alongside God the Father. He was with God. And so there we've got two scriptures that verify that. Let's look at another one. In uh, John chapter 8 and verse 58, when Jesus spoke to the Jewish leaders, he stated that he had been present before Abraham. He said, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, the Gospel of John makes seven statements to uh, flesh out what the term I am actually means, and the Old Testament uh, does that as well. And hopefully we'll look at that in, in two or three weeks from now. But he says, before Abraham was, I am, Jesus said. And uh, Abraham, we know, was the father of faith, and we know when he lived. He lived about 4,000 years ago. And so Jesus says, I was present before Abraham came on the scene. And so he was there back before then. And so he wasn't just born as a baby 2,000 years ago, and that's his whole story. No, he had an existence way, way, way back there. And then finally, in John chapter 17 and verse 24, in his prayer, Jesus affirms his Father's love for him, and then he says, before creation. Of course, referring to the creation of the heavens and the earth, mentioned in Genesis 1.1, when he said, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. And so before the 
foundation of this universe, the heavens and the earth, Jesus said he knew the Father's love back then. And so his own words confirmed his, his pre-existence to when he came as a baby into this world. And so Jesus lived, had a life before he was even conceived in Mary's womb. That's point number one. Point number two, not only did he live, but Jesus was directly involved in the creation process. The constellations above and the earth below were created and placed in perfect order by the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We've already looked at Genesis 1.26 and saw how all those members were involved in the creation of mankind, men and women. And the following verses also testify to Jesus' role in creation. So again, let's go back to the book of the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Look at verses 1 to 3. It says, In the beginning was the Word. We've identified that's Jesus. If you'll continue reading, you'll see that. And the Word was with God. We've noted that. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now catch verse 3. All things were made through him, that's Jesus, and without him nothing was made that was made. In other words, he had a hand, he had a part, he had a role in all of creation at that time. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him, if you read the context, it's talking about Jesus, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And so this elaborates a little bit on what we've already said. And so the universe, the heavens, and the earth were made by him, through him, for him. But not only that, the invisible realm has been made by him as well. And so when it talks about thrones and dominions, principalities and power, now we're talking about the spiritual world, the spiritual realm. And a lot of people think angels come from uh, dead people who die and go up. And if they've been good enough, they, be, they get their wings, as the movies say, and they become angels. Well, that's a myth. It's a fallacy. It's not the truth. The Bible clearly says angels were created by God. And so that's what this is saying. This is saying Jesus was there in that act and had a part in it. And then one more verse here is Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, which says, God has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Obviously, that's Jesus, since God only has one begotten Son. That's what John 3.16 says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son, that whosoever uh, would believe in him would have eternal life. And so we know God's only got one son. And uh, so he, in, the, in these last days, has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. And so there we've got in three books, three different authors uh, supporting or adding to what we already read in Genesis, that Jesus was directly involved in the process of creation. Okay, so that's number two. Let's move on to point number three. Uh, Jesus was conceived of an earthly or a human mother and the Holy Spirit, and we read that text earlier, and he lived a sinless life. So let's pick it up. Let's read it from Luke 1 this time, 31 to 35. The angel Gabriel was speaking to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and said, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. 
and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And then Mary said to the angel, How in the world can this be, since I don't know a man? I've never slept with a man. How can I get pregnant? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High, or the Highest, will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And so it happened, and so it was. And that is why in the Gospels Jesus is called both the Son of Man at times and the Son of God at other times. He was both at the very same time. Now, if we're familiar with Scripture, we know that to pay for man's sin, God required a perfect sacrifice. You can read the Old Testament to see that reiterated over and over and over, how when people brought their lamb or their, their goat or their uh, bull or whatever it was, it was to be perfect in every way. No blemishes, nothing wrong with it. And so that's what God required for a sacrifice for sin. But every person since Adam has been born with a sin nature, and not only that, has sinned. Romans 3.23 confirms that. For all have sinned, and all people have fallen short of the glory of God. And so there's a bit of a problem. And so God had to intervene and provide a sinless, perfect sacrifice. And without the miraculous virgin birth, in which Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, there would be no sinless sacrifice and no salvation for mankind. And so it was important that the Holy Spirit had a part in this to create a sinless person. And then, of course, Jesus had to be faithful to live his life out without giving in to temptation to sin. Hebrews 2, 17 and 18 tells us, Therefore in all things he, that's Jesus, had to be made like his brethren in the flesh, had to come as a human, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. And he really came to the earth with a primary purpose of going to the cross. That was really the primary purpose of him coming to earth. To make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now that word propitiation means a sacrifice that was acceptable to a holy God. And so because God is without sin, completely holy, he needed a perfect sacrifice to get rid of all sin. And Jesus was that acceptable sacrifice. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, and so it's not like Jesus came as a human but was spared and protected, lived in a bubble, and didn't have any temptations to sin. No, it's saying, no, he lived and he was tempted, yet he is able to aid those who are being tempted because he successfully avoided giving in to temptation and remained without sin. And then Hebrews 4, 14 and 15, seeing then that we do have this great high priest, Jesus, who has passed through the heavens, after he left the earth, he ascended back up into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our, our confession, our convictions. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so Jesus was born of a, of a virgin and of the Holy Spirit, and he lived his life sinless. And that's what was needed as the sacrifice for sin. So that's point number three. Let's move on to point number four. Jesus is both God and the Son of God. <laughs> I've got a Sometimes family relationships can get interesting, and uh, 
my dad's brother, Uncle Dave, his wife's name was Annie. Now, and so she's my aunt, Annie, but she's also my mom's aunt because she was my grandma's sister. <laughs> and so sometimes human relationships get a bit convoluted and we end up with these interesting dynamics. But this is really unique, that Jesus is both God and the Son of God. Throughout his ministry, <coughs> Jesus equated himself with God the Father. He said, we are equal. In John 10 and 30, we see the phrase or the Jesus' words. He says, I and the Father are one. He's talking about one in equality. Now, just a side note here is uh, there is a doctrine some people believe called the oneness doctrine. And they actually believe that Jesus is the only member of the Godhood, that he at times fits the role of the Father and other times the Son and other times the Holy Spirit. But that makes Scripture rather confusing when you read some verses that have all three mentioned in the same verse. And there's a few verses like that in the Bible. Uh, and so we don't believe that. Or that's not part of the doctrine that we hold to. We believe there's actually three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And here he says, I and the Father are one. Well, why would he mention the Father if he was actually the Father? And so that would be a rather strange thing to say if, uh, if he was all three. And then in John chapter 12, just a couple of chapters over, verses 42 to 45, it says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, in Jesus. But because the Pharisees did not, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of man more than the praise of God. And then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. So he's referring to God the Father. The person who sent him, again, is in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He sent Jesus. And so he's referring to God the Father who sent him. And he who sees me, Jesus says, sees him who sent me. And so what's he really saying? He's saying, I and the Father are so much alike. We have the same values, the same purpose. We're both sinless. We're both completely righteous. We're both completely holy. If you're seeing me, you're really seeing a true reflection of the Father. And that's really what Hebrews goes on to say. So that's what he's saying there. And that's how to make sense out of that, that verse. And then again in John 14, verse 7, he says, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And so he's saying, if, if you haven't got it yet, I'm a true reflection of the Father. And so now that you're hearing that from me, <clears throat> when you see me, Think about, that's how God the Father is also. That's really what he's saying to the disciples in that verse. He's saying, you may, you've read the Old Testament. See, they didn't have the New Testament when Jesus was there. And so they were familiar with the Old Testament. God the Father is the one mentioned in the Old Testament. And so in their minds, they would have had this concept of whatever they came up with from the Old Testament. And so Jesus knew that a lot of them didn't have the right concept, and God the Father knew that too, and that's why he sent Jesus to the earth, one of the reasons. And so Jesus is saying, whatever your concept of God the Father is from the Old Testament writings, you're seeing me and how I live and how I relate and what my principles are. 
those are the same as the Father's. And so if you're seeing me, you're seeing the Father. And so readjust your thinking if you didn't see him like that previously. It's really what he's trying to get across. All right, and that brings us to point number five. One of the purposes for Christ's first coming was to give mankind a greater understanding of God, and that's what I've been talking about here. We know, of course, the central purpose of him coming was to go to the cross to be that sinless sacrifice. But another purpose was to give us a clearer picture of what God the Father is like. Colossians 1, 12 to 15 says this, it says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He, the Father, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Now, where do you get an image? Well, you look in the mirror, probably did that this morning before you came. And what did you see there? You saw an image of yourself. Not the exact self. You're, you're not in the mirror, but you saw an image of yourself. And G, this scripture says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. We noticed a couple weeks ago that God has never been seen by man. But he decided it would be good for us to be able to see him. And so he sent his son, who is the accurate reflection of who he is. That's what that's saying. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, on your own, I encourage you to <clears throat> take that word image and go back and read Genesis 1.26 again and compare this verse in Colossians with Genesis 1.26. In the beginning, mankind, Adam and Eve, were made in the image of God as well, in his likeness. And uh, they were given the option, of course, to make a decision regarding temptation. And we know that the first Adam <clears throat> didn't do very well, and he gave in to temptation, and he sinned by eating the fruit of the tree that God said, don't eat of that tree. Eat anything else, just not off of that tree. Now he gave in, and, and he committed sin by not following God's instruction. The second Adam, as Jesus is referred to, uh, was created sinless in the image of God as well. And he was tempted, as we've already seen, yet without sin. Yet he did not give in when temptation came along. And so I just encourage you to do a further study into that, uh, the first and second Adam. And uh, I think I put the scriptures there in your notes, Romans 5, 12 to 19, and 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 49 and 15, 21 to 22. And so the first Adam brought sin and death into the world by giving in to temptation. The second Adam, Jesus, overcame sin and overcame death that the first Adam brought into the world. And interestingly, both actions had to do with trees. The first Adam wrongfully eating the fruit of the tree, and the second tree, of course, was the cross. Just an interesting study there. In Hebrews 1, 2, and 3, it says, God has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, Jesus, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, that's the Father speaking, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, that's Jesus, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So again, there's two people there. Jesus sat down on the right hand of another person, the majesty on high, God the Father. 
And so the oneness doctrine just doesn't make sense in so many places in the scripture. He wouldn't sit on his own right hand. <laughs> you know, he'd have to have a split personality or something. Something very wrong with that. All right, let's move on to point number six, which is Jesus' teachings were often perplexing to the natural mind. And uh, I thought about listing the seven statements that Jesus made. Those are very perplexing statements, but hopefully we'll cover those in a couple of weeks, and so I didn't list those here. But these are more statements that are uh, instructions to us about how to live. And so many of his statements don't make sense to the human mind or the natural mind. And if we don't engage our faith, we might struggle to accept and believe them. However, if we do obey his teachings, and that's what these are, they're teachings to live by, whether we understand them or not, we, if we obey them, we will experience the truth and the results of these statements, and will also become living a living testimony of Jesus to all those who see us live in this unconventional way. And so, some of the things that are in the Bible are kind of hard to wrap your, your human mind around, but Scripture is all about trusting by faith. That's what Christianity is all about trusting by faith and developing that relationship with God based on trust and faith. And so if we'll accept that these are good principles because God gave them and actually live by them, then we will see the benefits and blessings of them in our life and others will see us living in an unconventional way. What do we mean by that? Well, let's look at some examples. And this is just a, a few of them. There's many more. In Matthew 5, 11 and 12, for example, it says, Blessed are you when people insult you. The word blessed literally means happy. Happy. Happy are you when people insult you. Okay, has that been your experience lately? Not in the natural, right? If you don't accept that by faith and realize, ah, there can be a better, a deeper, more uh, purposeful meaning to this. If people are insulting me, it doesn't just mean I have to get depressed and frustrated. God says I can be happy. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you. Not only did they insult you, not just a casual, flippant comment to you, but they persecute you. They razz you, they terrorize you, they, they rub it in and they don't stop. They put some salt in your wounds and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. What? And it just goes on and on. And so they, they insult you, they persecute you, and now they start lying about you to other people. Do you think you were the first person that ever happened to? Didn't that happen to Jesus over and over? Yes, it did. Read the Bible. It happened to him. But it says, blessed are you, happy are you, when these things happen, if you've got the right attitude and the motive of faith. It says, rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. And so there's the command, have the right attitude, and then you have to choose the action instead of getting frustrated, instead of getting depressed, instead of getting angry and fighting back and reacting. No, it says, ah, let it run off your back like water, you know, off of a duck. Don't get bent out of shape when uh, not everybody likes you. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is in heaven, not here. Don't worry about making too many strides with people that don't really like you. God's got a better plan, a bigger plan, but it's a future plan. So there's one example of how Jesus' teachings were often perplexing to the natural mind. If you just try to understand them from human dynamics here in this world, they don't make much sense. Here's another one, Matthew 5, 44. He says, but I say to you, love your best friends. No, 
love your enemies, your enemies. Not only that, bless those who curse you. People don't really like you. The people from the verse before <laughs> that we just talked about. Do good to those who do good to you. No, to those that hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So again, it's a, it's a way of life that just doesn't make sense to our natural minds, but it's kingdom life, it's kingdom living. This is the sphere of God's world that he invites us into. And he says, you want to start living like me, reflecting my image. These are the kinds of principles you need to get inside of you. Not just inside your head, but inside your heart so that you live them out. Because these things are going to happen to you in life when people are going to insult you, persecute you, say, lie about you. They're going to hate you, do bad things to you. They're going to become your enemy. That's going to happen to everybody. How are you going to respond? Well, Jesus is teaching us how to respond if we want to be Christians, little Christs like him. All right, here's another one, Matthew 20, 27. Whoever wishes to be first needs to run really fast. Is that what it says? Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Or another word for that would be the servant of all. If you want to be first, if you want to be the greatest in something, if you want to be the most in, uh, enjoyed by God, Learn to be the servant of all. Yeah, be first. Be first to say, I'll do it. I'll help. I'll volunteer. I'll give a hand there. I'll do what's needed. Yeah, be the first to do those things. But don't say, I'm the first. You should listen to me. No. Here's another one in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 36. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, this is Jesus, let him deny himself or herself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, of course, the cross can be anything that's challenging, trying, not easy, to be suffering. So deny yourself, take up a cross, and follow me. Follow me or live by the principles I'm giving you to live by, regardless of your circumstances, even in the midst of difficulty and suffering. For whoever desires to save his life will in the end lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, Jesus says, and the Gospels, We'll save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains this whole world, talking about the material world, but loses his own soul? And so we know if we're going to come to Christ, we need to do it in humility, in uh, brokenness, and uh, that's the only way we can be really sincere about being sinful and recognizing our need for him. But it's not just a one-time thing. It, Jesus is saying, that's how to live life. Live with these attitudes every day. That's pretty challenging. Here's another one in Matthew 5.5. 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, sometimes we think that word meek means weak, but it doesn't. It just sounds similar. Uh, it really means strength under control. But when you have strength, you probably know that you have strength. You know, if you can stand up and talk to people who are very intimidating, for example. If you're not intimidated back, you know you can hold your ground and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with people like that. Okay, that would be meekness. But how do you put yourself forward in situations like that? 
Do you become arrogant? Do you become intimidating yourself? Do you become aggressive? Do you become manipulative? How do you interact in situations where meekness is needed? Well, meekness in God's economy also includes humility and a severe trust in God. And so if you've got those qualities while you're standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with people who maybe aren't friendly, aren't your best uh, helpers, then it says you stand a good chance of inheriting some of the earth's bounty as well. There's a blessing in that. All right, another one, Matthew 10, 34. Do not think <coughs> that I came, Jesus is talking, to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Wow. Doesn't the Bible say you're the prince of peace, Jesus? <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. And uh, he does bring peace to the hearts of those who put their trust in him. But here it's talking about family dynamics, dynamics between people. And uh, sometimes following Jesus results in severed relationships with those unbelievers who will no longer accept us because of our commitment to Jesus. That's what he's saying. So following these commands, and there's many more in Scripture, uh, these commands, these principles, these blessings, requires a humble heart. That's probably the number one ingredient on our part. And a willingness to surrender to Christ daily so he can use us in whatever way he desires. There's no room for any kind of pride in our lives if we want to receive the benefits and the blessings that come from following the principles that Jesus taught. Rather, when we live out those principles Jesus taught, we exemplify his character. We start to become a reflection of God ourselves. And that is what followers of Jesus are really called to do. We're to point everybody to God. And one of the ways to do that is with our life, how we live. Am I reflecting? Am I living out the same principles that he has? And that's what we're called to do. All right, point number seven. Jesus' name is like no other name, past, present, or future. Although many take Jesus' name in vain, God's word attributes unusual power and honor to his name. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11 says this, says, Therefore God has also highly exalted him, Jesus, and given him the name which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so here we see when those principles that Jesus taught, when they're lived out, because Jesus lived them out, he demonstrated that while he was here on earth, he actually lived those out. It's Father God that elevated him or blessed him, gave him the inheritance of living in a humble way where he sacrificed himself, he denied his own wants, and he became the sacrifice that the Father wanted him to become. And so he lived out all of those principles I just read about. And as a result, God the Father highly exalted him. The Father elevated him and gave him a name that is above every name. And one day, every knee will bow. A true believer should recognize the unparalleled beauty and importance of Jesus' name. And as a result, we should humbly, respectfully, and gladly let him be Lord of our lives. That means he is in control and that we obey what he says, all of his words. 
And so from the verse we just read, we see that there is a day coming at the great judgment when even those who have rejected Jesus one day will bow and confess that he is Lord. But until that day, it's up to all of us who call ourselves believers to make Jesus' name great to those unbelievers who don't yet know Jesus personally. And once we've known him personally, it changes everything. Luke 24, 46 to 48 says, Then he said to them, Thus it's written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Now, a name is associated with a person, and after you've lived for a while, people who have been in that community who know you and know your name will, will, will uh, associate certain things to your name, either positive or negative. And so at the name of Jesus, there's certain things that are associated to him and to his name. And so your name becomes who you are. It takes on your character, your personality. And so Jesus' name has everything to do with, it, it tells the story of who he is, what he's done, and what he's like. The love that he has and how he gave himself for the sins of mankind. And so that's why his name is so precious. Jesus also taught some important principles about his name. In John 14, 12, and 13, it says, Jesus said, Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. And it's incumbent upon us as believers to develop our relationship with Jesus to the point where we get to understand what that verse actually means. And then in Matthew 18, verses 19 and 20, Jesus gives some wisdom on how to carry out church discipline and the importance of his name in that context when he says, Again, I say to you that if two or three on earth, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. And so Jesus honors a gathering of two or more believers when they are gathered in his name and for his purposes. Then in Acts 3 verse 6, Peter demonstrated that he understood the authority and the power of Jesus' name when he healed a lame man. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And so Jesus' name carries with it his authority that he's been given by the Father. And when Peter and John were asked by the Sanhedrin to explain how they had healed that lame man, they replied in Acts 4.12 by saying, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men or two people by which we must be saved. Salvation is only available through Jesus, through his name. And so truly, Jesus' name is like no other name, past, present, or future. And then the last point that we'll look at today, number eight, one day Jesus will return to earth as the reigning king and judge of all mankind. In Matthew 25, verses 31 to 34, we read, when the Son of Man, that's Jesus, remember he's referred to sometimes Son of Man, other times Son of God, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. 
All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them, one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right hand, remember it's Jesus that's going to come back as king. First time he was a priest, he's coming back as king. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Of course, that's the kingdom of God often mentioned in the Gospels. And then he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, the demons. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And so one day Jesus will return to earth as the reigning king and judge of all mankind. Well, we've looked at who Jesus is just briefly today in an introduction. And although this has only been an introduction of, of uh, Jesus' character, let's just recap quickly what we've learned. So number one, Jesus lived before he was conceived in his mother's womb. He was alive from eternity past till eternity future. Number two, Jesus was directly involved in creation, had a hand in creating the universe, the earth, everything that we know. Number three, Jesus was conceived of an earthly mother and the Holy Spirit, and he lived a sinless life. He was tempted, but he did not give in to the temptation as the first Adam did. Number four, Jesus is both God and the Son of God. He equated himself with the Father, and in order to be a true reflection, of course, he had to be. One of the purposes for uh, Jesus' first coming was to give mankind greater understanding of God. Again, he was that image of God, but in human flesh, people could see him and get a better picture of what God is actually like. Number six, Jesus' teachings were often perplexing to the natural mind if we don't approach them with belief and trust and faith. They're not going to make any sense, and we certainly probably won't carry them out, and hence won't get the blessing from them. Number seven, Jesus' name is like no other name. God has highly exalted his name, because of his obedience to come and die on the cross, which is the main purpose that he came for, because of his obedience to the Father's plan, uh, the Father elevated his name and exalted him above every other name. And number eight, one day he will return to earth as the reigning king and judge of all mankind. What we have in the Bible is... is uh, quite a bit of information, and it's sufficient to all that we need. But did you know it's not the whole story of Jesus' life, even here on the earth? In the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, it says, Truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And so that's the reason why we have what's written in the Bible and when I talked about the Bible, I talked about how we have so many different authors of it, and yet there's a, a, a scarlet thread of salvation that runs from Genesis to Revelation, that there's this theme that mankind gave into temptation and sinned, and therefore it, it developed this gulf between us and God. But God wants us to come back together again. He had to find a sacrifice to get rid of the sin. 
And he did that with his only begotten son, Jesus. And because of that, we can have all of our sins forgiven and come back into right relationship with God the Father and have fellowship with him and the promise of eternal life with him for the future. And so many other things uh, that Jesus did uh, haven't been written down here, but the most important things were. And they're all for the point that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, he's the Messiah, he's the one that brought salvation, and he's the anointed one, priest and coming king. He is the Son of God, the powerful one, and that believing requires your faith. You may have life, that spiritual life, new life, saved life, eternal life in his name. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we're so thankful that you did send your one and only son, Jesus, into this world. And it's all because you loved us. That's what John 3.16 says. And it's so important that we understand that, Lord, that you uh, took an act to demonstrate your love. And uh, you provided a way because we couldn't provide any means for ourselves to live sinlessly or to overcome our sin. And the very best that mankind could do were the Old Testament sacrifices where they'd sacrifice an animal, but they had to keep doing it year after year after year because they kept sinning year after year after year. And God, you want us to be uh, restored when we confess our sin and get forgiveness for our sin. You want us to be restored and, and you want us to be transformed from the inside out so that we begin reflecting your image once again to other people around us and help us to uh, make it known that, that they can have that experience too, that they can have sins forgiven and uh, have their lives totally changed and as a result and have new principles to live by, new purposes to live by so that they can receive spiritual blessings both in this life and for all eternity. So thank you, Father, that you've given us the way to have your blessing of a forgiven sin and the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.